Winston Churchill was in his early 30s, tried with all of his power to awaken the English-speaking uh, world to the impending dangers of a resurgent Germany. And at the time, Germany was being influenced by one Corporal Hitler. Um, and not too many people would listen to what Churchill had to say. Yeah, I find it so ironic that after he had done so much um, on his part to avert the conflict, that when war broke out, Britain turned to Churchill in order to fight the Nazism. And years later, American President Roosevelt asked him a question. He said, uh, what, what do you think the, the war ought to be called? And he very quickly, not hesitantly, but very quickly stated the unnecessary war because he tried to warn and they would not listen. Churchill knew the difficulty of getting people to listen, especially listening to things that they don't want to hear and to be confronted with tough choices that would affect their lifestyles. And what is true, I would say, in the political world seems to be true, very true in the theological world, and that is it seems like there are less and less people who want to hear the truth. Too often the truths given in God's word, they don't line up with people's lifestyles and therefore they're willing to follow a corrupt culture rather than following the truth. As soon as Paul was saved, um, we know that he gave his heart totally over to the Lord, wholeheartedly into uh, he got into the battle. And as Churchill tried to get the English-speaking world to recognize the evil of um, a man and his intentions, the Apostle Paul challenges Christians to recognize the evil one, doing his best to try to get people to recognize the evil one, who he is, and what we can do to stop him. That's the reason why we read in, in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 10, Finally, brethren, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. The Bible teaches that the devil is real, that the devil is powerful, but it also teaches that the devil is defeated. And yet this defeated foe temporarily maintains power with which he and his satanic forces work to undermine Christians' trust in Christ and overflow, uh, uh, overthrow the um, Christian's obedience to the Lord Jesus Christ. A Christian who doesn't recognize this is a Christian who is not ready for battle, and as a result of it, that Christian will be victimized. Now, if there's one thing as a pastor that I see of people that have been victimized by the devil. He's, ruined, he's hurt them, he's ruined them, he's hurt their families, and... Uh, they're, they're victimized. You cannot uh, access the strength to overcome the devil for victory unless you put on the whole armor of God. That's what you have to do. That's what our whole series is about. And uh, that's why we're bringing this series, Put On With Stand. Here in verses 10 through 13, we've read to you, it exhorts us twice to put on the whole armor of God. And now we come to verses 14 through 17, that Paul will reveal the armor that we should wear. Today, we're only taking one, and that is the belt of truth. Three words that I'll give to you about that. First of all, the battle. The battle. There's no question that the forces of hell are warring against God's people today. And hear me, Christian, when I tell you we are in a battle. Satan wants us to act immorally. Uh, if God is moral and God sets the moral law, then any act against God's law is immorality, uh, whether it is sexual or social, whatever it is. But the battle we face, Satan wants us to disobey God. That's what he wants. 
Your personal devotion to Christ will be attacked. Your doctrinal convictions will be attacked. Your fellowship with others will be attacked. And he attacks people by confusing them with false teachers, false doctrine that comes on the scene, by hindering God's work, by causing division, by attempting to get Christians to trust in their own resources, and by becoming worldly and acting in disobedience to God. That's how Satan works. We go on and on of his deceptions that he uses. But too many of God's people are being engulfed into Satan's lies and he is constantly pushing us, all of us, into the world. He wants us to be worldly. He wants us to be like the world. And that's where the battle is. We've got a battle today, and that's why Paul steps up, and the first words he says today that we're going to talk about the bell is, Stand, therefore. Those are the words he says. Stand, therefore. And as a Christian soldier, we must stand firm in the face of attack. Back in verse 10, Paul says, Be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. This is a divine imperative. You see, to live in spiritual weakness is to live in spiritual rebellion. And that is true. Understand that. If you're going to be a weak Christian, then you're living in spiritual rebellion. God's command to us, be strong. To stand. And strength to stand is found in submission to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. You cannot experience divine enablement if you do not submit to divine authority. God's not going to help enable you to do the things that you need to do in this life if you do not submit to his authority. James tells us, therefore submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Spiritual warfare, hear me now today when I tell you that spiritual warfare is not about learning how to fight the devil. Spiritual warfare is about learning how to obey the Lord. That's what it is. And on the eve, uh, um, to give you an illustration of that, on the eve of the battle of Jericho, you remember the story of how Joshua encountered an unidentified warrior with his sword drawn. You remember that story? Joshua asked, are you for us or for our adversaries? There in chapter 5, verse 13 of Joshua. And he answered, no, but as commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. You see what happened there? The Lord does not take sides. When the Lord Jehovah God shows up, he takes over. And that's what he did. He came in. It wasn't a matter of taking sides. He took over. I love this story, and I know you've heard it before. Uh, during the U.S. Uh, Civil War, Abraham Lincoln was asked what he thought, thought if the Lord was on the side of the Union. That's what he was asked. And he answered, <clears throat> it does not matter if the Lord is on our side. It only matters if we are on the Lord's side. And he's absolutely right, friend. It reminds me of the famous a uh, hymn writer, Frances R. Abigail, she wrote so many hymns that many of you would know. But she asked the question, and I like this hymn. She asked the question, who is on the Lord's side? Who will serve the king? And I like that she finally gets down to the end of the hymn, and she answers the question the same way that you and I hope all of us can answer today. We are on the Lord's side. Savior, we are thine. We're on your side, Lord, and uh, that's where we ought to be. We must be strong and stand because Christianity is a, it's a battlefield. It's not a playground. Uh, it's a battlefield. Some Christians act as if it is a playground. But the enemy of our soul is at work to undermine our trust in Christ and overthrow our obedience to him. So you have to stand your ground. And to do that, you have to, you must put on the whole armor of God. This is a reminder that we're not called of God to go out and to attack the devil. That's not what we're called to do because he is already defeated. It says in 1 Corinthians 15, 57, but thanks be to God who gives us a victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. So Jesus won the victory on our behalf. So we're called to stand. That's what we're called to do. We're called to stand. And to do so, 
We must be armed for battle. We must be dressed for battle. So we put on the whole armor of God. Which brings me to my next point, and that is the belt. We're finally to the belt. Stand therefore, having girded your waist. Now in the ancient world, the Jews, the Gentiles, especially in the Roman world of men and women, soldiers, civilians, it didn't make any difference who you were. During that period of time, they wore what you call tunics, you know, a hole in the head, two arm, two holes for the arm. You'd slip it over and uh, it would be like a robe, you know, that we would, we would, uh, can contemplate and think. And, um, it was okay to walk around with that tunic or that robe of just uh, normal everyday uh, business. Um, you know, it's all gathered around out here and, uh, you know, but when it came time for work or it came time for war, you would tighten that belt and take the four corners of that tunic and pull it through the belt, making it like a mini tunic. Uh, in other words, it would give the worker, it would give the, the soldier mobility, flexibility, ability to move around and it doesn't get in his way. You know, you sure don't want that thing to get in the way. Can you imagine getting out there and fighting a battle with that big old rope? All it would take is some guy to come along and pull that thing up over your head and you say, woo, it's all over with, you know? And so, uh, you don't want that to happen. You, you want to, you want to take that belt and, and tighten that thing up to where it's not going to be in your way. This is the first piece of armor. The Bible tells us that we're to put on. And yet many Christians, they never put on the belt. You got to have the belt. You're going to fight. You got to put on the belt. And as a result, they're just sort of flopping through life of blowing in the breeze. There's just, and what I mean by that, there's no commitment. Their lives are that way. They don't really care much about what's going on. And they, and that, that's why they, you know, some, they, they never give to the Lord. They don't serve the Lord. None of those things. And be honest with you, I, I just don't comprehend that. To be honest with you, I really don't. I love the Lord so much that I don't understand why people that call themselves Christian don't want to stand for the Lord. And uh, they don't want to get in this battle in order to win this fight, to win other people for the Lord Jesus Christ. Why is that? It says in Hebrews 12, 1, Since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight. That's what we're to do. Lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Now, we've all watched the Olympics, and uh, I'll tell you, to me, every time the clothes get more and more skimpy, is that not true? It's, it's embarrassing, you know, what they wear today, and of course, I understand why they're wearing what they're wearing, because they don't, it's the same thing that we're talking about here, of not being uh, impeded, uh, not having nothing that's going to slow you down or that's going to get in your way. There's nothing any worse than getting tripped up you know by by something and uh, so uh it's just uh it, and it can happen but i you know can you just imagine with me today knowing what they wear going to the limits can you imagine if somebody showed up at a track meet or uh, jumping on the high jump with an overcoat on can you imagine that you know i don't know that they would go very far it reminded me when i thought of this of a guy when i was in junior high and i loved to run but there was a guy in junior high that he had, he was kind of a tall guy, but he moped around everywhere, drag around and so slow. And he had these big old um, high top tennis shoes and never tied the things. You know, I don't know how they stayed on. And he, we would get out there and we'd have, you know, races. Back then they had the presidential award, you know, that you would work for. And he'd get out on the track to race, and I'm telling you, he would blow by every one of us. He was so fast. I don't know how he did it. I don't remember that he ever tied those shoes up, but he could run so fast. But yeah, I just can't imagine getting out there with an overcoat. But putting on a belt with, uh, it, it was a picture of freeing yourself from all the encum uh, encumberments, uh, the entanglements that so easily cause us to slip up and to trip up. They do. Something gets in your way, you're going to trip, you're going to fall. And put that in the spiritual realm today, if you would. 
You know, strapping on the belt, it carried the idea of being ready for action, being ready for work, being ready for battle, whatever it might be. Peter said, therefore, gird up the loins of your mind. You know, you got to be ready. You got to put that belt on, be ready for what's, what's coming next, what you're going to be facing. And Satan is coming. And because he's coming, we better be ready to fight because he's coming. However, exactly what does that belt represent? It's more than just a physical picture of a, a soldier strapping on the belt, but it's a spiritual call to arms. It is saying that you must be ready for battle. You must be ready for an attack. You must be ready to stand your ground when the enemy comes to fight back, and he will. I promise you, he will, especially if you're trying to live for the Lord. He's going to come. Put on the belt so you can be ready for battle. What does that belt really represent? Brings me to my third point today, and that is the belief. Stand, therefore, having girded your waist with truth. This is what you've girded your waist with, with truth. And our culture is confused about a lot of things today. But you know what, friend? I can narrow it all the way down and tell you that the, the, the bottom line is, is confused about the truth. That's what it's confused about. It's confused about the truth and whether there is such a thing as objective truth. Two points I'll give you under this, and that is the attack against truth. That's the first thing. Satan has ramped up his pressure on Christians And I would say to you, especially our young people that are in high schools and universities today, especially, all of us, but I'd say especially there, um, I mean, it's a ground where young people are learning and their minds are developing, and I promise you, Satan in the evilness of this world is wanting to pull them in the direction of the world and of the evil one. So they go and they get around others who believe things that, uh, are totally opposite what they believe. They're around that, especially in the universities. And the temptation is for them to be a little bit more vague, uh, a, a little bit more tolerant in areas when God has stated this thing as a, as truth, as a fact. This is the fact. This is the way it is. This is what's right. This is what's real right here. That's what God says. And hear me, young people, when God says it, you can bank on that. I don't care what other professor says. It doesn't make a difference. What God says is truth. And this scheme, it's a scheme of Satan. This lie is working in many of our denominational churches today, including some Baptists. I've heard some woke Baptist preachers who have said that I never would have thought that they'd said some that I know some that are well known uh, across the country that have said that we need to curve the edges a little bit on our sermons, uh, just a little bit, in order to make the lost world feel more comfortable. We're hearing this more and more in our country today. And what has happened? Uh, you're seeing, uh, you're seeing a, a, a lot of um, people drifting away. Thank God some are going to churches that are preaching the truth. But I, I would, I love what John Stott said about this. He said years ago, just as the world is becoming more aware of its need, the church is becoming less assured of its mission. And the major reason for the diminishing Christian mission is the diminishing confidence in the Christian message. And he's absolutely right. Where is the battle in America today? The battle in America is for truth. That's where the battle is. It's for truth. And truth is neither, uh, it's either loose or it's tight. It's one of the two. It's either relative uh, and dependent on our feelings or it is absolute and it's dependent on some standard outside of us. It's one of the two. And the world around us wants us to believe that it's all subject to our inter- interpretation. That's what they want to believe. Now, if you're talking about the best hamburgers in the city of Winter Haven, I saw that the other day someone put out there, where's the best hamburger in town? Well, that's subject to interpretation. And I told the first crowd today, 
Don't be coming to me and telling me that McDonald's is the best hamburger in town. You know? And sure enough, I had someone after that first service come and say, Pastor, I don't care what you say. They've got the best hamburger in town. I'm thinking, buddy, you don't know what a good hamburger is. (laughs) Do they really call that hamburger? (laughs) Now, that's subject to your interpretation. However, I'm telling you that if you're driving 95 miles an hour down the highway on a 65 miles an hour zone, the Polk County deputy is going to pull you over and he's not going to think too well of you when you say, well, I just felt like I was going 65, you know? And I'm telling you, friend, that when you stand before the judge, he doesn't give a rip about how you feel. You know, if you were to tell him, well, I just felt like I was going 65, well, he said, he's going to say, son, I'm going to tell you, It doesn't make any difference how you feel. We're going to go by the law here. And the law says you're going to pay a penalty for going 95. You might go to jail, you know. But I'm telling you, our culture tells us to come to our own understanding about the truth. Tell that to a law officer next time you're breaking the law. That this is your understanding of, you know. And he said, well, we're going to let the judge take care of that. But you know, my friend, I'm going to tell you, that's a lie right out of the mouth of the devil of us just to try to have our own understanding of what truth is. And no wonder I would tell you, he's been at it since the beginning. In Genesis chapter 3, Satan shows up as a serpent there in the garden, and he starts up with his lies, his half-truths, his deceptions, And he says, has God, talking to Eve, has God indeed said you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And Eve said, well, we can have the fruit from all the trees, but there is just one tree that God said, don't touch lest you lest you die. And I want you to know Genesis 3, 4, he says there, here it is, he's contradicting God's word when he says, you will not surely die. He's a liar. That's not what God said. He's lying on what God just said. And my friend, humanity fell into sin because Eve bought the devil's lies rather than obeying the truth of God's word. You know, it comes down, what are we going to do? We're going to listen to the lies of the devil in this world. And, and you know what? A lot of the world is, and there's a lot of pressure there. You, you know, it even causes some good people thinking, well, if everybody else is thinking that way, maybe they're right. You know, people get to that point where they're thinking in that vein. You know, you have to guard, you have to be careful of that. And she bought the lies rather than obeying the truth. And this is how Satan works to bring people down. This is how he works to bring families down, churches down. It's how he works to bring nations down, countries down, is by people believing a lie. In John chapter 8, there is a great argument between Jesus and the religious people. And they come to Jesus and they say, we don't know who your daddy is. And Jesus always had the right answer and knew exactly what to say. And he said, well, I know who your daddy is. And he goes on to say in John 8, 44, you are of your father, the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and he does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. And when he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of it. Those preachers that say, we just need to curve it a little bit, why don't you tell Jesus that? There's no curve in that message there, is it? When he talked to those religious people that that had a problem, and he told them that they were of their father, the devil, he told them, Satan is a liar, and you have to watch out for him because He has strength in deception. That's where his strength is. That's why it says there in verse 11, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand the wiles or the schemes of the devil. And hear me when I tell you today, the power of Satan is not force, it's deception. That's where he's going to come at you and deceiving you. It doesn't matter how the world portrays him. 
He is a liar. The devil never shows up. I told you last week in some red suit displaying his evil. No, he doesn't do that. Second Corinthians eleven fourteen. Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. That's the way he comes, portraying himself that way that he's good. Now listen to me. When the devil shows up, he doesn't show up as evil. He shows up looking just like what you like. I'm talking about what your flesh wants. That's the way he shows up, to deceive you and to make you think that this is good and that this is wonderful. Oh, I want that. That's the way the devil shows up. But hear me when I tell you that he's a trickster. He's a deceiver, deceiver. And he sure doesn't want to reveal the, the consequences of evil or the consequences of disobedience. He hides, he disguises, he manipulates. And if you don't know the truth, you will fall for his, the schemes of the devil every time. But hear me now today, but when you have been wrapped up, but when you have been belted in the truth, then you can stand your ground. You better have that belt on. You better have the belt of truth and you can stand your ground. When you know the truth, you're not going to be tripped up by his lies. Athenius uh, was a man. He was an early bishop in the fourth century of Alexandria. And uh, he's a man that took a stand for truth. And he stood against a man that was giving some claimed to be a religious man, but he was giving false teaching, a man by the name of Arius, and he claimed that Christ was not the eternal Son of God, but that he was just some subordinate being. And uh, we find that Athenius, he was, he kept on preaching the truth, taking a stand against this other man that was false teaching, and they literally threw him out of town five times, until he was finally brought before the Roman emperor and the emperor told him that he was going to stop um, preaching against uh, Arius, that he was going to quit doing it. And the emperor scolded him and said, do you not realize that all the world is against you? And he came back and said, then I'm against all the world. And I like his answer. He took a stand. If all the world is against us, friend, we've got to take our stand. It's imperative that we are wrapped and secured in the truths of God. And Satan is clever enough to deceive the whole world, even some people that are sitting in our churches. And so the whole world may stand against us, but we must rest on the second thing, and that is the authority of truth. That's where we've got to rest today, is on the authority of truth. You remember Pilate? You remember he was the one as he stood there? Um, Jesus is, is uh, soon to be crucified. He's been arrested. And Pilate, he's the one who asked Jesus the question, what is truth? But you go on and find recorded in the scripture there that then Pilate proceeded to have truth beaten. And Pilate put a crown of thorns on truth. And he hung, he nailed and hung truth on a cross. However, Jesus showed Pilate truth and authority when he got up and walked right out of that grave. That's what he did. And my friend, I'm telling you, there is no grave that's going to hold down truth. Nothing in this world is going to hold down truth. And believe me, Christian, when you go to war, you don't want the teachings of this world or the philosophies around your ways. That's not what you want around your ways. You want Jesus because there, my friend, that's the truth. Jesus is the truth. He's the one that you want. There's nobody born like Jesus. There's nobody that's ever lived like Jesus. Nobody spoke like Jesus. Nobody died like Jesus. Nobody got up from the grave like Jesus. And I promise you, ain't nobody coming back like Jesus. He's the only one that's coming back. Uh, for us as promised and he will as he has all other things Jesus is the truth Christianity is the truth the gospel of Jesus Christ is the truth and listen closely to me today when I tell you everything about Christianity hangs on the truth 
Everything on the truth. God the Father is truth. The psalmist says, but to your name give glory because of your mercy, because of your truth. God the Son is truth. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. That's the reason why Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. God, the Holy Spirit, is truth. But when the Helper comes, whom I shall send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will testify of me. We know where the Bible talks about the truth. The church is called the pillar and the foundation of truth. The gospel is called the word of truth. The scripture is truth. John 17, 17. Your word is truth. Living a godly life is called walking in the truth. Worshiping God must happen in spirit and truth. Everything in the Christian life hangs on the truth. Everything. Jesus himself said, to those Jews who believed him, if you were, if you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. It will. You want to be free in this world? Then know the truth. Young people, be careful. You're going off into uh, universities and colleges. Make sure that you know the truth. The truth will set you free. The things of this world will bind you and they will destroy you. They will corrupt your mind. You can't and you won't know the truth unless you know God's word. That's where God's word is. That's why it's important for us to be in God's word every day so that we can know the truth. And God help us to be like the Bereans. There in Acts chapter 17 tells us that they were more noble than the Thessalonians because they received the word with all readiness and search the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. And that will all be said of us. That we're daily searching to see if they're so. You know, it's my prayer for every member of this church that when you come here on Sunday morning, you come here with a good, a good attitude and a big appetite. I hope that's what you come here uh, with. I hope you come here as excited as what Hannah is for her next birthday. Okay? But you're... You're excited about what's going to take place here, the word of God that's going to be proclaimed, the songs that we're going to sing, the, when we hear the choir sing all these things. I hope that you're excited about that. And I thank God for people who are eager to hear the truth. Every once in a while, I have someone say, Pastor, I can't wait to hear the message today. And that's music to my ears. I can't wait to hear it either, even though I've studied it. You know, I'm, I'm excited about it, about the message. And you know what? Don't take my word for it. Go home and read the scriptures for yourself and make sure that it is the truth. Look at it there. I don't get to sit under preaching much because uh, I'm normally the one that is preaching. Time to time, this last trip I took to Australia, I preached two Sundays, but one Sunday I had the opportunity to go and hear someone else preach. And you know, I am, I'm real excited. You probably saw me write it. Some of you saw it on Facebook. I drove four hours to hear, go and hear a person speak uh, that morning. I got up real early. And, um, you know, in this little bitty podunk town I'm in, in the interior of Australia, they actually had a McDonald's there. Can you believe that? Can you believe I stopped at a McDonald's? It wasn't for a burger, though. It's for their breakfast sandwich, okay, which is halfway decent. <laughs> I uh, probably shouldn't say this going out on the air, but anyhow, um, they're doing all right without me, I promise you. But uh, anyhow, I put all that in the front seat, and I'm, you know, flying down the highway four hours away from where I'm going to go to church that day, and kangaroos jump out in front of me, and I have to slam on brakes, and all that goes down to the floorboard, you know. And uh, But anyhow, didn't, didn't ruin it too bad. <laughs> you know the three-second rule, pick it up real quick and blow it off. And uh, it'll be okay. <laughs> but anyhow, we made it there. And I'm not going to say too much. I would say that everything he said, he gave a lot of scripture verse, gave, uh, gave no illustration, no application. I'm not excited about anything. And as a disappointment for me right away that day, I had a message on my heart. 
And I had to really search my heart whether I was right with God about it because I wanted to preach that day because I had a message in my heart. And I felt like those people needed a message so bad. There was a whole group of, a lot of young couples there. And uh, I said, God, I, you know, is that arrogant on my part to want to be the one to preach? And, uh, and I searched my heart about that, but I just didn't feel like the people got anything. And how sad that is. I'm going to tell you, when I go, and I, I like, you know, I get to go to a preacher's meeting every now, and I need, I need to do that because I need to hear preaching. But when I go to hear someone preach, I want to hear him preach the word, be ready in season, out of season, convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. I want to hear the word of God. I want to hear a man get up and open up the Bible and give the word of God. And Christian, I'm challenging you today to see Satan's deceptions for what they are and put on the belt of truth. You better put it on. He's coming after us. I like the old English hymn writer of the 17th century, Isaac Watts. You, you know a lot of his hymns, but he wrote a hymn with questions that every believer ought to answer. Some of you remember the old song. Am I a soldier of the cross, a follower of the Lamb? And shall I fear to own his cause or blush to speak his name? Are there no foes for me to face? Must I not stem the flood? Is this vile world a friend to grace to help me on to God? And I love that last verse. Sure, I must fight if I would reign. Increase my courage, Lord. I'll bear the toil, endure the pain, supported by thy word. Will we do that? Are we a soldier of the Lord Jesus Christ? Are we a follower of the Lamb? Do we listen to the word, the truth? J. Oswald Sanders told about a painter years ago who painted a picture of a young man playing chess with the devil. Some of you might have seen that painting. And the agreement was that whoever lost would become a servant of the winner. And in this picture that was painted, the devil had just called checkmate in three moves. And you can look on the, the boy's young man's face and it's a look of utter horror that the devil has won and his soul belongs to the devil. Years later, the world, world's champion chess player, Paul Morphy, some of you that are, are chess fans uh, would recognize that name. He was invited by a friend to look at this valuable painting called The Chess Player. And Paul Morphy looked at the picture. He stared at it. And in his mind, he's moving piece by piece and this piece here, trying to figure out. And then after a while, he shouted, young man, there's a move that you can make. The painter had overlooked a move the young man could make. You may feel like your life is lost to you, and you may feel like your life is lost to Satan. But in the midst of your darkness and in your mess, I'm here to tell you as a gospel preacher, there's a move that you can make. Because Jesus opens the door and says, come to me. You come to me. God's already provided for you. God's already provided salvation for you, what he did for you on the cross of Calvary. Jesus says, come to me. He says, come, let him who thirsts come. Whoever desires, let him come take of the water of life freely. Jesus is the living water. He gives you living life, eternal life. And hear me today when I tell you that Jesus is the only one that can satisfy your soul. The world, the devil tries to give you things that, that will tell you that will satisfy you, but they do not. I'm so, it breaks my heart to see young people go off uh, away from home and the world tries to tell them of things that satisfy their soul and they have, they sad that they have to live out and mess up and have the consequences of things to find out that they don't satisfy. They don't satisfy. They only ruin and they only destroy. Jesus told the Samaritan woman at the well, whoever drinks the water that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. Jesus wants to save your soul today so you can have this living water. Christian, we better put on the belt. 
because the devil's coming for us. You know what? You say, well, I'm kind of nervous about all this. Don't be nervous. Put on the belt and live for God. Let God take care of him. He will. Our God's a lot stronger. The devil's already a defeated foe. He's going to fight us in the meantime until God finally deals with him. But we've got the Lord on our side, or we're on his side. Because we're on his side, he's on our side. And he'll fight for you. Put on the belt.